Hi everyone and welcome to today's Alex webinar on preserving family textiles. I'm Stephanie Lamson. On behalf of the Alex Continuing Education Committee and the Preservation Week Working Group, I'm delighted to introduce this free webinar as part of ALA's Preservation Week. Our presenter today is Bronwyn Eves, an objects conservator from Springfield, Illinois. Bronwyn has been a conservator in private practice since 1999 and has worked for museums and private collectors throughout the state, including the Field Museum of Natural History. A professional associate in the American Institute for Conservation, she has also interned at the Museum of New Mexico, the Harvard Peabody Museum, and the Art Institute of Chicago. Bronwyn is currently the project manager of the Illinois Collections Preservation Network, whose goal is to ensure the long-term preservation of collections in the state. Before we begin, a few quick notes on today's webinar. If you have questions during the webinar, please type them into the question box on your screen, and Bronwyn will do her best to answer as many questions as possible at the conclusion of her presentation. Also, please note that today's presentation will be recorded and available at the ELEX webinar website. You're also invited to use the Twitter back channel, ELEXCE, to interact with other participants during the webinar. However, please continue to submit questions for the presenters in the question box on the screen. Neither the presenters nor host will monitor Twitter during the presentation. And with that, I'm going to turn the program over to Bronwyn. Good afternoon. Thank you, Stephanie and Alex and the American Library Association for having me here today. I'm delighted to be here to talk about textile care, and I applaud the ALA for setting aside a week each year to promote the topic of preservation of collections. Thanks also to everyone who has tuned in to learn about care of their own collections. Museums, libraries, and historical societies actively collect the artifacts that document the history and material culture of our communities. And within these institutions, we realize that the individual collector is an invaluable to the interpretation of our collective history. Collecting institutions do not have the resources of space, time, money, and staff to care for an infinite amount of material, so we do rely on individual collectors to care for their artifacts. Conservators and curators understand that someday your collections may become part of an institutional collection, and the better care it has in your hands, the easier it makes our job. People collect a wide range of objects that can fall into the category of textiles. Many of these materials have similar requirements for preservation, and today I will be addressing the basics of textile conservation. The first recommendation I have is to document in writing those things that you think are important about your piece. Where did you get it? Who wore it? Who used it? How is it used? Why is it important to you? Share this information with family and friends and tell them that you have documented it and where you have kept the documentation. Gather the basic information you know about the piece, the date it was made, the date you purchased or received it, did you meet or know the person who made it, who were the former owners, how was it used, how is it significant in your family, did you purchase it to commemorate an event, a trip, what did it cost. These are all details that can come together to make your story. I also encourage you to photograph or videotape your textiles. Get some overall pictures or video as well as some close-up detail pictures. These images can help for insurance purposes if needed, but they also serve as a guide to how your piece is changing over time. I think we would all like to think that we can look at something and remember a year or five years what it looked like, but our memories aren't always reliable for color changes and slight changes in our textiles condition. Textiles seem like relatively sturdy objects, the things we use in our everyday lives. We walk on rugs, we toss clothes in the washer, but they're really quite fragile and vulnerable, especially as they age. By identifying the threats to their long-term preservation, you can begin to remove some of these hazardous conditions and help preserve your collection for future generations. Light. Light is a form of energy called radiation. The radiation that textiles are exposed to is damaging. This includes the visible part of the spectrum and the ranges such as UV light, 
that we hear about as damaging to our skin. We can and often do remove the UV radiation from museum exhibits using filters, but removing the visible light isn't an option for exhibits at home or at the museum. We need light to see our textiles and our collections. The light damage that can happen includes fiber weakening, color changing, some materials darken with light exposure, and some get lighter. All light damage is irreversible. Conservators would love to see textiles shielded from all light all the time, but we understand this is not a practical bit of advice. So our recommendations start with filtering or avoiding natural light altogether. It has a high UV content. You can do this by choosing a location away from a window to display your textiles, use shades and curtains, uh, and not only having them in place, but remembering to close them during the day. Then try limiting exposure to artificial light. Turn off the lights when you're not in a room, direct the lights away from the textiles. You may even consider another approach, which is used in museums, which is rotating your collection in and out of display. Resting this object in this way won't reverse the damage, but it will limit the time that the textile is exposed to light. The temperature and environment. In the past, conservators have used strict guidelines for temperature and humidity ranges in collections areas. More recent research shows that changes in temperature and humidity are acceptable as long as they're gradual. In a home environment, it's not practical or in some cases possible to keep to rigid ranges. Do remember that heat accelerates deterioration, high humidity promotes mold growth, and low humidity weakens textile fibers. None of these are good for your objects. So in a home, obviously personal comfort is going to take precedence, but the good, good news is that what is comfortable for you is good for textiles. Try to keep the fluctuations to a minimum, especially the extreme ones. For example, if your textile is in a home that no one occupies certain times of the year, consider removing the textiles when you yourself leave that home. Dirt is obviously something that should be avoided on new dirt on textiles. Um, if you have old dirt on your textiles, I'll address vacuuming and some cleaning options in a minute. Handling your textiles. Use care when handling your textiles. This is where a lot of the damage can happen. Make sure and wash your hands before you handle your textiles, or you may choose to wear white cotton gloves, which are readily available, or nitrile gloves from the drugstore are acceptable too. Support large textiles when moving them. Enlist the help of others to help you move them, or use a large sheet as a sling to avoid putting too much stress on a large textile that you might be moving. Remove your jewelry, which can snag on textiles, including belt buckles, watches, and rings. Insects. Most textiles are very vulnerable to pests. Moss and carpet beetles can do a lot of damage to your collections. You can begin to avoid this with good housekeeping. Keep the area around your textiles clean. If you purchase a new piece, you might consider isolating it, if possible, to watch for insect activity before you introduce it into your home. This can be done by enclosing it in a plastic bag for about three to four weeks. For smaller things, a zip-top bag will do. For larger ones, you can make an enclosure by using plastic sheeting and tape. Try to use a clear plastic sheeting so that you can see what's going on before you open it. Once you have these enclosures, you'll monitor them. If you see bugs, parts of bugs, or small debris at the bottom of the bag over the course of a few weeks, you know you have a problem. If you detect a problem, immediately isolate the piece, as I described above, if it's not already isolated. And then you probably need to contact a conservator to eradicate the infestation completely. If you do vacuum up any insect debris around your textile, make sure to seal and throw away the vacuum bag so as not to reintroduce that pest problem somewhere else in your home. It's no longer recommended to store your textiles with mothballs. It's been determined that they really aren't that useful and the chemicals are very carcinogenic as well. Storage materials, we'll get to more of that in a moment. I'll just say that poor quality framing and storage materials contain acids, 
which can migrate into your textile and damage and stain the textiles. I included theft on this list. It's something to be aware of. Your textiles that are on display in your home are obviously more vulnerable than those that are tucked away in a closet. And I've heard that just by adding an extra deterrent or two to a criminal, you can discourage the thief. For frame textiles, this might be using a small L-shaped plate screwed to one side of your frame and then the other screw into the wall, making it difficult to remove. Vacuuming is a terrific, terrific option for cleaning textiles, and it's something that I feel comfortable recommending that you can safely do in your home. Knowing when to vacuum um, is a good question to ask yourself. If there's a moderate to heavy accumulation of airborne dust or dirt, which most of us would have if something's stored openly in our homes, that's a good time to vacuum. If it's an older piece and you've purchased it and it has accumulation of dust or dirt, it might be a good idea to vacuum it. Dust is very hygroscopic, which means it attracts moisture from the air. And the moisture combined with the dirt can lead to staining or mold growth or both on your textile. And those are much bigger problems to deal with than a simple vacuuming. Dust is also abrasive. If you can imagine a speck of dust viewed under magnification, and then imagine that speck moving over the surface of your textile, you get an idea of the type of damage that can be done over time to the fibers. I am comfortable recommending vacuuming, as I mentioned, but it's not to be done lightly. It can cause a lot of damage if done carelessly. First, you need to inspect your textile to determine if it's a candidate for vacuuming, if it's heavily worn, particularly delicate, frayed, or has many loose embellishments, such as beads, then it probably should not be vacuumed. These are judgment calls that you will have to make in your collection. If you've determined that you can safely vacuum your piece, you'll need a few supplies a vacuum with attachments, a soft brush, and gloves or clean hands. The attachments that are shown on your screen are readily available online, and it comes with a um, connector to bring the size of your hose down to fit these micro-sized pieces, attachments. You might also choose to use a piece of nylon netting and a rubber band and put that around the opening of your nozzle. And this will serve two purposes. It will catch any pieces that might come loose, and it's important to save those. And it will also prevent the entire textile from being sucked up and attached to your hose, which you can imagine is not good. To vacuum your textile, open any vents you may have on your household vacuum to reduce the suction. Again, we don't need a lot of suction here. We're just brushing off dust. Hold a soft brush, such as something you might find um, in a hobby store. A variety of sizes is nice to have on hand. Usually hold the brush in your dominant hand and hold the vacuum tool in your other hand and gently lift up the brush and direct it towards the vacuum. Make sure not to get the suction so close to the textile that you're lifting it off the table. And if the garment is large, you'll work in small sections. You can use light weights or your arms to gently hold each section in place as you work. It's important not to work in one area over and over when you're vacuuming. It's better to go over the entire garment and then go back to the more soiled areas if this treatment is successful. If you work in one place too long, you risk creating a really clean area, and the area next to it might not clean so well. So then you've got a dark line between cleaned and uncleaned areas. Again, better to just go over the whole piece all at once. A few notes on the vacuum. Uh, there are micro tools available. Uh, they sell them a lot for cleaning computer keyboards, and they work really well. And also, those portable battery-operated vacuums uh, have a weaker suction, and they can be really frustrating when you're trying to clean up something in your home. But they're perfect for cleaning your textiles. Easy to hold, lightweight, and the suction isn't too stressful. Once the textile has been vacuumed, it's important to keep the area around the textile clean because our goal is really to vacuum the actual object as infrequently as possible. So cleaning the area, the floor, the ledges, window frames, this means regular vacuuming of the space. And even if it's a closet, if it's a uh, textile that you've stored away in a dark closet, don't neglect the routine maintenance there. It can really prevent a lot of damage down the road. And these are, uh, as far as how often to vacuum, they're just uh, considerations 
that you'll have to make in judgment calls um, based on the conditions around the textile. The two other cleaning techniques I'd like to address briefly, commercial dry cleaning. I would not, as a rule, recommend this for historic pieces. It could be okay for contemporary pieces, but you need to weigh the, weigh the risks carefully. It's a process that can have amazing results, but it also places the textile under a lot of stress. They're exposed to heat, chemicals, um, and abrasion and stress through the process of chemical dry cleaning. It can do a lot more harm than good if the textile isn't stable enough, that's for sure. I also don't recommend wet cleaning. That would be cleaning your textiles with water. Again, it's what we think we do with our textiles on a daily, weekly basis. Why can't I do this with my collectible or heirloom? They're just so much more fragile, and can, you can get into a lot of trouble and create irreversible damage by getting some textiles wet. So my blanket statement is avoid wet cleaning. Um, your dyes can run quickly. One dye might seem stable and another not, won't be, another next to it won't be. And these are uh, determinations that conservators make on a daily basis. Um, but to the average person, it's, it can be tricky. The fabric can tear, shrink, or distort upon exposure to water. And wet textiles in general are much heavier, obviously, and more fragile than in their dry state. So once you get that textile wet, uh, there are a lot of precautions you have to take on handling it. I also don't recommend spot cleaning with solvents or water. This can uh, lead to what conservators call tide lines, where the dirt or staining material is lifted up and moved away from the area you just cleaned, and it looks great. And then as it dries, a uh, ring is deposited around the area you've cleaned. So essentially what you've done is you've picked up that spot, that area of dirt, and you've moved it to a ring around, and the dirt's become concentrated, and now it just um, is most likely going to be a lot more difficult to remove. I realize that it's important to many collectors to display their collections, collections for their own enjoyment and to share with others. Conservators, most of the time, would like to see things tucked away in a dark closet. But again, we know that's not practical advice. Just be aware there are risks involved in displaying your textiles. Framing your textiles is a great approach if the size and shape allow. Any materials in contact with the textile should be archival, and a reputable frame shop will have access to these materials. You should ask for acid-free, lignin-free, cotton rag mat boards. A backing board on the back of the frame will protect against humidity fluctuations and keep dust out of the frame. Glazing is the name for the front covering of the frame piece, usually glass or plexiglass, and either one is fine for displaying textiles. Textiles do require UV filters on the glass or plexi, or it's recommended, I should say. Their disadvantages of glass are that it's heavy and it can break if dropped. The disadvantage of plexi is that it can build up a static charge which can draw the loose fibers or the edges of your textile up and stick to the plexi, and you can imagine that, how that could create damage over time. Another disadvantage of plexi is that it can accumulate scratches easily on the outside from routine cleaning. Whichever glazing you choose, it should never come in contact with the textile inside. The contact can crush the fibers or create a moisture problem if condensation builds up inside. Proper framing should include a window mat or spacer between the textile and glazing. And these materials, again, should be archival. And by asking a potential framer a few of these questions, you should pretty quickly determine if they will safely be able to frame your textile. Don't forget to ask how the textile will be attached to the backing board within the frame package. I once saw a frame textile that was glued to an archival backing board. And textiles and glue should rarely mix, especially in a frame shop. A quality framer will have some suggestions, but don't forget to ask about every detail of the framing process. Uh, often the best approach to attaching that some textiles to their backing board is just a few small, carefully placed stitches. And if you have experience with textiles or sewing, 
you might choose to attach the piece to the backing board yourself and then take it to be framed. And that way, you know that it's done in a safe way. Unframed textiles. Obviously, these are going to be more exposed to the elements in your home. And if this is how you choose to display them, there are some precautions you can take to preserve them. Really critical to avoid as much light exposure as possible and stay on top of routine maintenance. Again, I'm saying the same things over and over, but these are the most harmful uh, things to textiles. You also want to be careful not to place your textiles above a heating or directly above an air conditioning vent or over a radiator. Also avoid hanging them on outside walls. And this is true for frame pieces as well, but there's a little more leeway there because they have the added buffer of the frame enclosure and the backing board. An example of a textile displayed in your home might be a quilt on a bed. This is an excellent way to display it if you'd like to see it and not have it tucked away. It doesn't put any stress of folding on the quilt. What you would want to do is keep the windows covered in shades or light blocking curtains and remember the general maintenance of the room, as I've mentioned before. And then remember that it's a, not a regular quilt. Avoid stacking heavy things on the quilt for long periods. If it's in a spare room, that's an excellent place to display it. But those places are easily become the place where you go to with the boxes and the things that get forgotten about and left. And that's not good for the quilt. Another approach to hanging an unframed piece is to attach a sleeve or a pocket along the back of the textile to allow for a rod to fit through and hang it. And I will go into some of those um, materials that you might use for making that sleeve or pocket in just a minute. The two cards you see on the screen are called blue scale cards and are used in museum storage and displays to monitor changes in color from light exposure. It's a series of eight pieces of dyed wool and they're available from a company called TAC. Alice, which you can see on my research page at the end of this webinar. The one on the left has been kept in the dark, either in a drawer, sometimes they're covered with foil, and the one on the right was exposed to light. You can see the difference, the fading on the card on the right. These can be a helpful indicator of change. It's very difficult to detect gradual changes in color, especially if we see something all the time. The cards aren't cheap, they're about $18 each. So that's a consideration as well, but they are helpful in detecting changes. I have two sort of more unique or maybe radical approaches to displaying or sharing your textiles. One is to have a copy of your textile made for display and store the original. You may or may not even have this option. If it's a complicated piece or it can't be recreated, then it's obviously not an option. But consider it if it is an option. It really will allow the original to stay in the dark and, and stay preserved. And then you still have the option to enjoy the copy. Another kind of offbeat suggestion is to have a high resolution, and I put this in quotes, portrait made of your piece. And again, store the original. You can hang the portrait on your wall as a reminder of all that your textile represents to you. I realize those are ext sort of extreme recommendations. They may not work or be appropriate for you. That's fine, but if they are, they, um, I think they're interesting options. Where are you going to store your textiles if you're not going to display them? Storing correctly is essential for long-term preservation. Avoid basements and attics. I'm not going to say too much more about that. You can imagine why I recommend that. These environments are usually uncontrolled, and we tend to put things in these rooms and forget about them. You also want to avoid wooden chests, drawers, and cabinets for storage unless you have a barrier of archival materials between the object and the wood. The ideal environment is clean, dark, and has only gradual temperature and humidity fluctuation. Well, guess what? Insects love these dark places, too. So you must monitor them throughout the area where your textiles were kept not just put them away, consider them safe, and forget about them. I recommend sticky traps in the areas to alert you when you have pests around. They're a quick and visual snapshot of what's coming and going. 
For storage supplies, there are a few suppliers that I recommend, and you'll see your names at, their names at the end of this presentation. They do a terrific job of describing the appropriate use of the materials, and they have good customer support, these companies. They mainly supply museums and libraries, but don't hesitate to contact them for individual products. They're very helpful, and if you request one of their catalogs, you will see they have great tips on how to use their products. There are two main types of archival boxes and tissue that you will be using for your textiles, buffered and unbuffered. I won't go into the details of their compositions here, but you can read up on them with their suppliers. Both of these types of tissue are acid-free. The general rule is use buffered paper for storing plant material-based fibers such as cotton, linen, and jute, as well as for synthetic material. Use unbuffered products for wool, silk, leather, and fur materials. If you're in doubt or you have a composite object, which is very often the case, choose the unbuffered acid-free tissue. I will tell you that most of the boxes sold by archival suppliers are buffered, so if you're storing wool and silk and proteinaceous material, it's best to use an isolating layer of unbuffered tissue paper between the box and the textile. What is a tissue good for? It can prevent creases. Once you get a crease line or a fold in a textile, it's very difficult to completely remove it, and the measures you have to take to completely remove it aren't always great for the textile. The tissue paper will prevent dyes from transferring one textile to the other or one area of a textile to another. And the tissue will also prevent acids from migrating into the textile. Tissue is great for separating small items that may be stored together. And it's also good to fill out objects such as purses and gloves so they retain their shape as they age. When you have um, a pair of gloves, um, possibly a pair of shoes, they seem, the material seems real flexible and you can move it around. As they age, that material is going to get more and more rigid and it's not always going to be possible to fill it out and make it look like a glove again. If a, a pair of boots slumps over for years and years, you might never be able to straighten out the, the leather. So if we store it in a manner with tissue, using tissue paper that it resembles the manner in how it was used, then you will retain that shape over time. A few comments about boxes. It's a great way to store your textiles. They allow for smaller items to be kept flat, which is good. We like flat. Larger items that need to be folded but can still fit inside a box should be fully padded out with tissue, as I mentioned. Try to have as few folds as possible. This means using the largest box that you can safely handle and that you have room to store. So consider those things before you pick your box size. The boxes come in a wide variety of sizes, and you can even custom make your own box if you order sheets of archival board. This starts to get a little complicated and tricky, and it can be done. Or you can have a custom box designed and made by a conservator. The hanging of textiles on hangers can be a safe way to store some items. The hangers should be padded. And there are several great how-tos on the web about making padded hangers. Be sure not to overcrowd the hanging area and never store your textiles wrapped in plastic. This creates a potential for mold due to the decreased air circulation. And the plastic will also emit gases as it ages that are hazardous to your textiles. Unbleached cotton muslin is a good, relatively inexpensive storage material, too. It provides protection but still allows for air circulation. Just make sure to wash it once or twice without detergent before you use it to remove any fish finishings that may have been applied. I mentioned earlier the use of old sheets. This can be a great, use, a great material to use for dust covers. It's best if they're white or light colored so the dyes don't transfer onto your textiles. And remember to wash any dust covers you're using periodically. A note on starch. Don't starch your clothing before you store it. The added starch material can lead to yellowing over time, so it's better to eliminate that step. Rolling textiles is a great way to deal with large textiles. But remember, you still will need room to safely store the large roll once you have it ready to go. 
there are some numerous how-tos online, especially on YouTube, and one I will mention in particular on how to roll textiles. The Minnesota Historical Society has a wonderful series of six videos on the care of textiles, and the sixth one is on rolling. These are very helpful and can walk you through the process visually much more easily than I can communicate it here. So I encourage you to look up those videos. Of course you know by now that if you're rolling a textile on a tube, you don't want that tube to be acidic, or you don't want the acidic material in contact with your textile. Archival tubes are expensive. There are a few choices for covering a regular non-archival tube that you may have access to, and the best material I've heard of recently is aluminum foil. Use it to wrap completely around the tube, making sure to wrap just over the ends a little bit. Remember that your whole package is going to get heavy. You're going to be adding tissue paper in between your roll and the cover, the textile itself rolled up. Uh, so make sure and choose a sturdy tube. A few basic notes I will mention on rolling. Make sure the tube is slightly longer than the textile you're rolling. This will give you something to hold on to as you handle the tube and when you need to handle it, you're not crushing the tube, the textile, excuse me, you're actually holding on to the tube. Don't roll too tightly. Use tissue paper as you roll to interleave and isolate the rug from itself or the textile from itself. And roll in the direction of the weave. Once you've boxed or rolled or hung your textile, if you store it away in a dark closet, which again I keep recommending, I love that, but check on it periodically. Replace the storage materials occasionally. Most archival materials are going to be good for many years, but it doesn't mean forever. When to contact a conservator. Decide what it is you want to do with your textile. Do you want to display it, maintain its condition, or improve its condition? Most storage product, projects excuse me, can be handled at home, but any repairs and especially cleaning are complicated, and I recommend using a conservator. Conservators are a relatively small group of professionals. Usually we understand that public outreach and education is part of our profession, and we are willing to talk with you about the care of your collections. This is a small Plains Indian bag that I treated for the Illinois State Museum. Um, the potential for loss of all the material at the handle is just great, and so I do encourage you, if you have damage, to talk with the conservator. It's only a matter of time before those little pieces are gone and more little pieces are gone, and next thing you know, the handle's gone. But addressing it up front ensures the integrity of your piece over time. How to contact a conservator. Conservators work in museums, libraries, regional centers, and historical societies. There are also conservators in private practice. To contact a conservator at an institution, start with your local museum or library. If they don't have their own conservation department, they can most likely tell you the nearest conservators. To contact a conservator who will do private work, use the American Institute for Conservation of Historic and Artistic Works, or AIC, website. AIC is the only national membership organization of professional conservators in the United States. Click on the Find a Conservator link on the home page, and there you can search for a conservator based on location and material specialties. Many institution conservators will give advice over the phone, but due to the nature of the work, this can be difficult. Each project is really unique and the needs are very specific based on lots of different factors of the piece. Don't be surprised if they can't give you a definitive answer specific to your piece, but they are sure to be a wealth of information on collections care. Some private conservators will charge for consultation but I'm willing to bet that most do not. And talking over the phone is, uh, you can gain a lot of information. And I'm sure that um, most conservators you contact would be willing to do that. How to work with a conservator when you find that you have a project that you need their help with. Most people think of conservators as people who fix things. Conservation actually has two branches, preservation and restoration. 
Conservators are trained in preventative care, which includes some of the things we address today, like proper handling and storage of materials. Every material has slightly different requirements, and every artifact has a unique set of needs. Conservators take measures to avoid repair and restoration. Some materials are more fragile than others, and accidents do happen. This is when conservators are called to repair or treat an object as we refer to it. Remember, when you do contact a conservator, we want to know the story of your object, and if we treat an object, we want to preserve any evidence of your story that's in your piece. Here's a list of some of the supply companies for reputable archival materials. There are definitely more companies out there. Again, check with a conservator or a preservation office at your local library on the um, integrity of a certain company or what company they might recommend or use. The company Talus that's listed on there is probably the most specialized company listed, and I listed that um, because that's where I got the blue wool cards that uh, indicate changes from fading. I've listed some of the sites I either got information for or images from for today's presentation and some other resources you might find useful. I've mentioned already a few times your local museum or library. Just an excellent resource. There quite often is someone in that building that, who has an interest and knowledge about preservation of materials. As I mentioned, even if they don't have a dedicated preservation staff, it is someone's responsibility in those buildings. And if not, then I'm sure they have the knowledge to recommend a conservator either in the area or in your region. Connecting to Collections Online Community is a wonderful web resource. It has gotten the attention of conservation professionals as well as individual collectors. They present webinars and they have a discussion board where you can write in a question and preservation professionals will comment and reply with advice and information for you. I mentioned the American Institute for Conservation already, professional organization of conservators, and their website has a lot of good information for the general public as well. The Illinois Collections Preservation Network is the group I'm presently working with in Illinois, and we are the Illinois branch of the Connecting to Collections program. It is a nationwide program, and you just might do a little searching in your state to find out if your state is putting together a statewide program for preservation. Uh, most of it is geared towards institutions, but Many of them have a outreach component, component to the general public, and I'm sure they'd be happy to share with you any information you might need. I cited the Minnesota Historical Society for their wonderful YouTube presentations on textile care. I highly recommend those again. The National Park Service has a series of leaflets called conserve o -grams. These are designed for the site um, the various sites the National Park Service oversees, but they're also very useful for general public. Um, they contain a lot of information on care. Each one's broken down by a topic, whether it is storage of certain material or um, another basic collections care topic. The Northeast Documents Conservation Center is a well-established center in the East, and they have, again, a lot of uh, public outreach information on their website. They serve um, a lot of museums and institutions and do conservation treatments at their center, but also have a very public component, which I find very useful. And the Canadian Conservation Institute has done a lot of research on textile conservation, has a lot of good information on their website. Thank you to Alex for having me here today and the American Library Association for asking me to do this presentation. I hope you've learned some useful information today to help preserve your textile collections, and I wish you many well-preserved memories and stories along with your collections. Here's my email address. I'm happy to answer questions in the future, and it looks like we have some time today for questions. I haven't been following the chat too closely, 
Stephanie, if you have any questions that you've been tracking, I'd be happy to hear them. Sure. Um, thanks for your presentation. That was great. There are a lot of questions about cedar. Cedar closets, cedar blocks, um, cedar chests, and what your view is on that and textiles. They do provide a environment where the textile is protected from a lot of the elements. They are very good at buffering temperature hum and humidity changes. Uh, and obviously, they're protecting your textile from the light. But wood does give off a of oils and even smells that you might not want your textile to take on. So I, it's with a bit of caution that I recommend using chest and cedar lined uh, drawers. Um, even those they sell cedar blocks that people put in with textiles. Um, so I um, again emphasize creating a barrier. Uh, textiles are affected by what's in contact with them. So um, any kind of barrier is um, critical when you're using wood as your primary storage. OK, so would you recommend then that instead of, you know, most people store things in cedar to get away from moths, right? So would you recommend then that they store them in a box within a plastic bag instead to get around that problem? Yeah, if you, the, the plastic bag, the box is, is great, a great first measure and barrier and archival box. Um, whether or not you go the next step of uh, protecting it from pest infestation is a little tricky. If you go ahead and put that box in plastic, you're protecting it from pests, but setting yourself up for a little bit of um, moisture condensation problems, um, mold growth. So we do recommend with textiles um, breathable materials. If in your particular instance you know that uh, annual or seasonal pests are a problem, then yeah, I might say go ahead and add the plastic. Um, but for the most part, the, the box should do the trick. And I think what I'm I tried to emphasize today is don't put your textiles away and forget about them. We do think it's great to store them away. Um, and the harder you make it on yourself to get to that textile, the less likely you're going to go in once a month, once a year, and look at it. Once a year is probably um, enough as the seasons change. Open up the box, open up the tissue paper, look around a little. If there's a pest problem, you're going to see it pretty quickly. Um, if there's mold growth, hopefully you'll see it or smell it before it gets too bad. Um, but again, if it's the boxes taped up in a plastic bag at the bottom of a drawer, it's going to um, you'll you'll be less inclined to open it up and see what's going on, and that's pretty critical to catching problems early. Yeah. Okay. Um. A lot of other people are asking about vacuums, if you have any recommendations for types of vacuums over others um, for special collections. Oh, gosh, that's a great question. Um, certainly in museums, there are very specialized vacuums are used. Um, they're quite expensive, uh, and I don't know if they're necessary. Um, if you look at some of the uh, websites and recommendations for people who suffer from allergies, airborne allergies, those are great vacuums and they're, they can be comparable to museum vacuums at a little bit reduced cost. Um, the main component that makes museum vacuums expensive is the HEPA or HEPA filters and these are able to trap uh, down to the very smallest uh, particle sizes which um, is an issue that I didn't really go into in vacuuming, but you do want personal protection too if you are dealing with a quite old textile, certainly if it's a textile that has been moldy in the past, you don't want to be vacuuming it and making all that mold dust airborne because that's a health concern. Um, so as far as a certain brand of a vacuum goes, I don't have one 
to recommend um, some uh, a feature that where you could control the suction is nice, high or low. Um, some vacuums come with a lot of different attachments. Um, those would be things I would look for. Okay. Um, here's a fairly specific question. Um, how can we stabilize a silk dress that shreds very easily when touched? We've managed to put it on a dress form. Should we leave it there? We are afraid to fold or put in a box. That sounds like a very fragile artifact from <laughs> that does. description. Um, and I hesitate to say what to do next. Um, shredding to the touch uh, doesn't make me happy. Um, I'm surprised that they were able to get it on a dress form, or impressed, I should say. Um, my instinct would be to remove it from the dress form. There's no way to reverse that damage. There, are, A conservator might be able to line it, which is taking a very thin synthetic material and either attaching it to fragile or deteriorated front or back areas. Um, one thing that I find as a conservator very helpful is when a client will send me an image. Um, they can call me and say, I've got this dress and this is what's going on. Quite often when they send me an image, I'm looking at something else or I'm seeing a condition that's much more alarming than what they originally contacted me about. So if you could take a few pictures of it um, and email it to a conservator that you could identify. I'd be happy to look at it for you. Um, I didn't go into too much um, the divisions of conservators. Um, most conservators specialize in an area of material and as I like to say we often specialize ourselves out of work. Um, you have the option to become a paintings conservator in graduate school, a book and paper conservator, and sometimes those are even further specialized. Um, and then the category of objects conservators can be a broad category or conservators have the option to specialize or just based on the type of material they've been exposed to in their training. They might have more experience in one area or another, but oftentimes textile conservators are their own specialty. And um, I'm not a textile conservator, but I would be happy to look at images and um, refer you to someone if it needed treatment. But I would probably think about taking that dress off the dress form. OK. Um, let's see. One person was curious as how long that talus card had been exposed to light, the one that was faded. I don't know if you have an answer to that one. Oh, I don't. To be honest, I took their images out of the talus catalog. Okay. Um, so it's going to depend on um, what range of the spectrum it was exposed to. Was it daylight? Um, um, that's a great question. And every light in your home emits a, a slightly different um, UV range. So I don't have an answer to that. Okay. They're fun to play with, though, to just have around and um, they are. see what fades. So here's a question, which is probably a pretty common one. Um, would you recommend storing pieces in plastic lidded boxes? That's a great question. Um, I wouldn't not recommend it. Um, it's very airtight, which can be good or bad. Again, we talked about the circulation around these natural materials. Um, we talked about light. They're, they're often translucent, so you're not getting a lot of protection there. Um, it's not the worst option, but it, a box would be better. Um, the plastic also can off-gas over time, which means all plastics break down and deteriorate and give off chemicals that are not going to be beneficial to your textile. And I'm sitting here trying to think if I would recommend a non-acid-free box lined with tissue paper over a plastic container. And I'm sort of thinking six of one, half dozen of another. But um, again, your eyes on that textile every so often, opening it up, allowing some air to circulate around, smelling for mustiness or mold. Those would be my concerns with the plastic box. Okay. 
Um, one person asked about the current view of wearing gloves while handling historic textiles. That um, too does change over time. I touched on it a little bit. Um, clean hands are excellent, um, but gloves are not as out of favor as um, they might be indicating, but um, it's still a great option sometimes. It can make you feel a little clumsy and make you not able to have the tactile sensation. Um, something very fragile, I'd go for really clean hands. Mm -hmm. um, if you know yourself and you know that you're handling lots of different things and you might not um, have a chance to clean your hands in between each, if each thing you're handling, if you're handling multiple items, then maybe gloves are a good option. Um, the nitrile gloves that I mentioned, uh, nitrile is an alternative to latex. So many people have latex allergies. In the drugstore now, they sell nitrile gloves in the first aid section. And they're pretty inexpensive. You buy a big box of them. They come in different sizes. And if you find the size that fits you, they're pretty comfortable for, for short-term work. Um, and you, you retain some of your tactile sensation I would note on gloves that I would recommend they have powder-free gloves. You get the ones with powder on them and it starts leaking out the end or when you take them off you get powder everywhere. So I would go powder-free there. Okay. Um, one person asked if you could repeat which textiles are better with buffered versus non-buffered tissue. Oh, sure. And that is... Um, looking at my notes so that I say it collect correctly here. There's um, plant material versus proteinaceous material. And the plant material is um, things such as cotton, jute, and linen, where the fibers are derived from plant material. And those would be buffered papers. And those papers have a additive that is going to um, counteract and offer another element of protection. Um, as the textiles age. And the unbuffered tissue paper is good for the category that we call proteinaceous materials. And that is wool, silk, leather, and fur materials. Unbuffered. Okay. Um. I don't know if this might relate a little bit to what you just answered. Someone asked, any recommendations for dealing with tex textiles that have a leather component? Uh, just depends on the um, artifact, I'm afraid to say. The old yeah. um, advice of feeding leather is no longer current thinking. Uh, leather does not need to be fed. and. So you don't have to worry about um, adding anything to your leather. Um, it's a little bit more temperamental. I don't know what the surrounding material is, but um, the leather can be sensitive to moisture. But it also is something you definitely don't want to dry out, because once it starts cracking and flaking, that's a whole host of problems that are yet yeah. become very involved. Um, so again, it would probably depend on the surrounding materials, but treat it um, as you would the other textile guidelines. OK. Um, this is probably a fairly common one, too. What ideas do you have for displaying and saving family 1920s cotton and velvet dresses? They're currently on hangers. Oh, it sounds like a wonderful collection. Um, as I mentioned, that hanging is a uh, a safe and appropriate um, technique. The cotton and velvet are pretty sturdy fabrics. I would um, definitely encourage you to look up the um, padded hangers and make sure the hangers don't extend out past the arms. So you really have to custom fit these mounts if you decide to display or hang your collectibles. Um, what hanging does do is it prevents folds, um, but it imagine you can imagine it places all the stress on the shoulders. The padding helps, making sure the hanger's the right size. Um, again, observing it over time, observe the floor. If you start to see 
frayed bits or particles of the dresses, um, then you're going to want to take them off the hangers and um, do an alternative storage method. And those are the main things that come to mind with that type of collection. Okay. Um, is there any way to correct yellowing at home, particularly for quilts? I assume they mean yellowing of the fabric. Um, there's no way to reverse that without washing, and textile conservators and textile conservation workshops have amazing large stainless steel um, wash tables. It's a, the size and height of a table and a shallow um, dish on the top where they can wash large textiles, and washing is a, a wonderful way to get yellow out, but uh, for the home um, collector, I can't think of any, any suggestions for dealing with that safely. Okay. Yeah, so contact a conservator. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, here's another one. Are anti-desiccants safe to use in storage? They are. If you think if they're referring to something like silica gel, and the couple of suppliers that I uh, noted do sell silica gel, it's a small bead that we've probably all gotten used to seeing. It often comes shipped with clothes and shoes, and it uh, can moderate the humidity. Um, you trying to determine the amount of silica you gel you use is based on the size of your container and then it does need to be replenished and changed out over time. Um, those are things that you'd have to make sure that you stayed on top of, so that's a maintenance issue. Um, if, and it depends on the surrounding environment. If you live somewhere very humid um, or quite dry, then that might be a, a great way to help you balance out your humidity. It, it takes some maintenance and a little bit of a learning curve on how to use it. Right. Okay. Here's another one. Are PVC tubes safe or a good base to cover with muslin or old sheeting tissue paper to make an inexpensive tube? I would rolling, I gather. caution you from the PVC tubes. I didn't go into types of tubes too much. Um, I really would recommend a cardboard tube covered with some of the material I mentioned. Um, the PVC is going to off-gas um, and, again, referring to the chemicals that are emitted as the plastic ages, and that's a constant uh, process. So um, I caution you against using most any kind of plastic or PVC tubing that you might have available. Um, that's not a good choice. Okay, so I think we've got time for a couple more questions. Um, is there anything that you want to answer on the list, or should I randomly pick out another? <laughs> if you know, I didn't get through too many of the questions. I was concentrating on the slides and everything going on there, so if you have a... I can ask another one. Um, here we go. Uh, Someone asked about mixed materials like 1920s sequins or celluloid and other combinations of ornamentation on garments. How would you store those safely? Would that be any different than your earlier recommendations? Um, just a more complicated version of the same thing, really. Um, the um, taking care to use maybe more tissue paper to interleave the um, the the layers um, you're not going it's not going to be possible to isolate the um, every little adornment um, but trying as best you can to isolate them from each other and from themselves um, maybe using a little more tissue paper and taking a little more time to um, to box that one up Um, this is an interesting one which has got intrigued me. Uh, mention the swimming pool noodles. <laughs> <laughs> I just 
saw that one myself. Uh, <laughs> we um, had a webinar presentation through the Illinois Collecting Preservations Network the other day, and uh, the presenter, Krista D.C. Quinn, um, talked about how she, at the end of the pool season, scoops up all the pool noodles she can find and uses them um, throughout her uh, collection. She works at the University of Illinois Spurlock Museum. Uh -huh. um, she uses them to build mannequins. Um, she can, will put a slit in them and um, wrap fabric around them to create a sling to carry textiles. And she has found all kinds of uses for them in her collections, storage areas. Huh. <laughs> and so those are OK to use for storage? Yeah. Yeah? yeah? OK. Well, that's a pretty good, that's a good option that's readily available, at least in the summer. <laughs> yeah. OK. Well, I think um, we're at time. So thank you very much, Bronwyn. Thank you. And I'd be happy to uh, look through the question list and answer some questions. If anyone, if I didn't get to your question, feel free to email me. OK, great. Um, I hope all of our participants will be able to use what they learned today to better preserve their family textiles. I think Bronwyn did a great job at getting at all the highlights here and should give you lots of practical advice that you can use. Um, thank you to all of our Preservation Week attendees. For more information about preservation, please visit ALA's Preservation Week website, where you can find great tips and resources to help you preserve your own collections. And please consider joining us for our next free Preservation Week webinar on preserving your digital photographs this Thursday. More information can be found on the Alex webinar website about that webinar. We hope you found today's session helpful. You'll soon receive a short online evaluation form. Please take a few moments to fill it out and return it to us. Your comments help the Alex Continuing Education Committee evaluate and plan future continuing education opportunities. And if you're interested in viewing parts of the presentation again or sharing it with others, you'll receive an email link. Uh, an email with a link to the recording shortly after the conclusion of the webinar. And the presentation will also be archived and freely available at the Alex webinar website. Thank you again to our presenter, Bronwyn, and to today's sponsor, Gaylord. We would also like to thank our Preservation Week spokesperson, Steve Berry, for his support of preservation in ALA's Preservation Week. And last but not least, thanks to Eva Sorrell and Jane Rosario for their technical assistance today. Thank you all again for joining us. And goodbye.